Good evening. Welcome to Live at Nine uh, for Thursday, the 15th of October, 2009. Now it's just me at the start. I don't have any guests here with me in the studio, but it's not just going to be me tonight because we have a great interview that we're going to show, uh, which will last uh, just under an hour. Uh, and if you will want to phone in, uh, if you will want to text in, if you will want to email in your questions during the interview, there's the number that you're going to have to make a note of now because that will not be up on the screen all the time. So if you think, when I tell you what's coming, if you think, hey, I really would like to text in or email in, make a note of those numbers now. We will take them as they come in and we will talk a little bit about them after we've finished. The interview tonight is going to be with Dana. International singing star, um, uh, came to fame uh, by the first Irish winner of the Eurovision Song Contest uh, at a, a developing singer at that point in time rushed to the to the top of the tree, as it were, and yet never lost her humility, never lost her grace, never lost her charm. And all the way through the interview you're about to see, that is the thing that came over to me. We uh, went down to Christchurch, uh, Joel, Pete and I, into uh, this dressing room, and I want to tell you, it, this is a, a, an achievement for uh, for Pete and Joel because there were three mirrors around this room. Every, uh, three walls had mirrors on, and you hardly ever see, if you ever see, the cameraman. And they were ducking, they were diving down, they were kneeling on the floor. But tremendous photography. And a tremendous interview. I tell you, it's the sort of interview that if I was listening to this as a testimony uh, at our meeting on Sunday morning, I'd be saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and really giving glory to God. And I do feel that that, uh, in the final analysis, is what this interview will do. It will give glory to God. Because uh, it will deal with the tough times, it will deal with the difficult times, it will deal with the good times, but it will deal with the hard times as well. And through it all, a trust in God, through it all, uh, a, a, a glory, giving glory to the name of the Lord. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, sit back, enjoy this testimony. Praise God as you're doing it. You want to text in an email in, fine. After we've seen it, we'll be trying to make contact uh, with Chris Gidney. Chris is the uh, leader of Christians in Education, and we want to uh, Christians in Education, Christians in Entertainment, and we will want to uh, talk with him uh, about some of the things that have been happening with Dana and some of the things that will be happening with Dana, and then I'll be taking your phone calls as well. So this is a great interview. Please sit back, enjoy, and bless the Lord as you're watching it. Christchurch in Dorset is the home to the 700-seat Regent Centre, which opened on Boxing Day 1931. Today it is home to both films and stage shows, such as the Variety Magic Show. Starring in the show, along with comedians Jimmy Cricket and Don McLean, was international singing star Dana, making her welcome return after 15 years away from the stage. Dana became an overnight singing star in 1970 when she was Ireland's first ever winner of the prestigious Eurovision Song Contest with all kinds of everything. However, fame was not everything for Dana, nor was her life always easy. But in this heartwarming interview, she shares her life, her achievements, her difficult days, and above all, her faith that carried her through all these times. Welcome to the dressing room of the Regent Theatre Christchurch, where I'm joined by international singing star, Dana. 
Thank you so much for taking time out of the oh, tour. Oh, it's great to, to see you again. Yeah, I know, I know. I, do you know, I, I have to tell people, you walked in and recognised me. I could not believe it. I really could. Once seen, never forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> now that people will believe. <laughs> I mean, it's 37 years ago we, we met at the Festival of Light in, yes, in, in London. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say I immediately recognised you <laughs> from then. And it's hard to believe that that was... It was, years it was ago. because I, I was married that year, that's how I remember, and it'd be our 37th wedding anniversary this year, so I, I remember it well. Although Irish, you, you were born in London. Yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that, uh, those early years, if you would, please. Yeah, I was born in Islington. My parents went to London after the war, and um, I have very vivid memories of there and of the neighbours. I remember my parents um, saying that they were able to rent a bomb damaged house, one of the big old tall like Georgian houses yeah, in Islington. Yeah, yes. And they arrived there with nothing. I mean nothing. And they got a bed from a cousin and a, this from somebody else. And the neighbours who had lived in that street during the war, one neighbours on one side arrived with a, a teapot full of tea. And the neighbours on the other side arrived with something for them to eat. Right. And that was the beginning of a really wonderful and happy, challenging, but very, very happy time there. And, and I remember um, the house, I remember my friend Lubu I used to play with across the street. You know, and I think we forget that young children have such retention and such vivid memories. So I, I do feel it very much a part of me, very much a part of me. Right. And then we moved back to uh, Northern Ireland and I lived there from I was about six years old. Um, well, until just after Eurovision, just around the Festival of Light, right. we moved back to live in London, yeah. and um, and I've been kind of between the two it's ever since. Ever since, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, was there a good spiritual upbringing uh, from, from from your parents? Was, was faith and, and God were they important to you in in your early life? Yes, they were. I was raised in a Catholic home, and. Um, a great um, awareness of God in our home and we prayed together as a family. Great. Um, we went to church together, um, but then we lived in a society where everybody did. Yes. So it, it was um, part of your, your faith system. You didn't think of it as part of your faith system, it was part of your life. And that's where you met up with all of your friends and your relatives and Yes, uh, very positive, very positive, and very, um, very real, you know, very down to earth yes. kind of a faith relationship. Yeah. And I guess so many actually miss that these days, don't you? Because <clears throat> that, as you say, may have been the norm uh, where, yeah. where, where, when you were growing up, but it's not the norm today. And, and society is missing something, not just going to church, but being together, praying together, um, uh, standing together in, in those situations. I think so often families just split up and goes hither and thither without any strength. Isn't well, it? well, there was a, an Irish priest called um, Father Patrick Payton who travelled throughout the world promoting family prayer. Right. And the motto of his organisation was the family that prays together stays together. Right. And that was the motto of his. I think it was family apostolate and he travelled all around the world. Um, and I think it's very, very true. Um, I suppose today we're living in a world that um, is actually hostile to teaching yes. the reality of God. Yeah. Um, hostile to any kind of visual sign that we believe in God. And we yes. live for eight years in America, and there's an ongoing struggle which we are very likely to see replicated in Europe, yes. where it will become difficult to have external signs wearing a cross, uh, having the Ten Commandments, having a crash at Christmas, where these visual signs will become more and more difficult to have. Yeah, and, and of course that's already beginning in, in, in this country as, as well. And it, it's tragic, isn't it, that, okay, they only may be outward signs, but they're outward signs of a reality behind it. And if you take away those signs, who is going to even begin to think about the reality? Yes, and also for children to be familiar 
uh, who may not be churched, who may not have uh, faith in their home. But at Christmas time especially, when we complain all the time about commerciality, yes, yeah. this money, money machine, if a child goes out and all they see are red bows and, and Santa Claus, yeah. and they never actually see the heart and the essence and the reason Amen. for the Christmas celebration, Amen. a crash, you know, a nativity scene, how are they expected to even be curious? Yeah. And, and children need visual things. They're, they're not really in deep thinking processes. They, they see things that interest them and then they ask, well, why this and why that? Yeah. So it will be to the detriment of our families and our society right. as they're pushed aside. Yes. But in your day, this was something that really you were so thankful of having because it's laid a foundation in your life hasn't it which which hasn't gone away which has deepened and and has grown over the years but it, it had to have a beginning somewhere yes it did and i i really do, i don't know how people survive without a faith in god mm. without a knowledge that there is a god yes. and that he for all our failings and <laughs> warts and all and for the many million times that we trip up and, and do things that we shouldn't, that he loves us yes. right where we are, warts and all. Yeah. And that he has, a, he has a plan for our life that we most times try to run from. Or if we knew what he was doing, we definitely would run yeah. from. <laughs> How often I've said to some, you know, people and people have said to yeah. me, if you had known... <laughs> And I'd say, no, no, definitely. <laughs> He's very crafty, you know, he, he, he kind of, he pulls you in and then suddenly, yes. you know, you're in the middle of something you would never dream of doing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's amazing. But I, I don't know how people live their lives and keep their sanity and keep peace without being assured that there is a God that mm. made us and loves us and cares for us. I mean, because we were saying that just before we started the recording, you know, as you look back over your life, you have done so much, and we'll touch on the, the various areas. But I, I guess, you know, if, if God had said to you at the beginning, this is what you're going to do, and then you're going to do this, you probably would have said, no, thank you, Lord, I, I don't want to go that way. Oh, I, let me tell you, I ran, from, I ran from him. Yeah. I was very resistant, you know, because for me, not for everybody, but for me and for some people that I've spoken to about this, there comes a time when you have to have ownership of what you are taught as a child, right. when you have to take ownership and it becomes yours. And my ownership began with a total rejection of what I'd been taught. You know, I just woke up when I was, and I was about 16. I woke up one morning and I just knew there was no God at all. And he was the big escape. He was like the putty that you put in the crack you know, keep you happy and move on. And, oh, I felt betrayed. I knew I'd been lied to. Oh, I was very, for about a year, I was very, very down. And we had a school retreat. Now, here's another reason for having uh, faith taught and represented in the school system. I couldn't talk to my parents about it or people close to me. I seemed like the only one in the world who really knew the truth, that there was no God. And we had a school retreat, and at the end of it, uh, you know, in, in our faith, you know, we go to confession. And I began to speak, and I burst into tears, and the priest said, speak to me afterwards. They met me afterwards, and he asked me what was wrong, and I told him. And he said, well, if what you say is true, then to live the Christian life has got to be the easy road. With rose-colored glasses, I said, yep. He said, well, I'm telling you it will be the most challenging, but the most fulfilling road you will ever take. And that phrase stuck with me, and it wasn't like an instant explosion of light, you know. It was just, oh, you know, I never thought about that. <laughs> and little step by step, five steps forward and ten steps back, right through over about another ten years, twelve years, until I, I came to the point when for me anyway, it was terribly hard to actually surrender to the fact that somebody knew better than me what I should be doing in my life. And, and maybe it's hard for, for a lot of people. It's natural to want to know what's ahead in life. 
and to want to plan and to want to have a certainty about where you're going or where you think you're going and to surrender um, and to hand over to this entity that you can't see and you can't feel and you you know and it just came to one moment with me when I just had a real like a physical awareness of the presence of God and and all of my anxieties and all of my fears and frustrations they just melted away and from that moment I, I never looked back I think that's very helpful for so many because uh, there will be some watching who are in the middle of that road that you went and well I don't know there's a God and I don't know if he can help me even if he is there and yes it's so great to know that there is a light at the end and if if we seek him and if we do give ourselves over to him he does not let us down does he yes I, I, I saw one thing I, I remember very well seeing hung on a wall of a an ice cream parlor <laughs> which I love and it was handwritten and it said truth rests on the heart until the heart is broken and then it enters in and takes root and most of us actually that moment of surrender is when we feel we cannot do it ourselves anymore and most of us go if there's anybody there (laughs) Please help me. Okay. Well, if there's anybody there, let you know, please yes. let me know. Yeah. And the moment you do that, that's I think the most sincere prayer of all. Yeah. And the moment you do that, the response is instant and swift yeah. and life changing. Yeah. I mean, it certainly has been for you, as as, as we can see, as, as we develop. But maybe just backtrack a lot. Very th- thank you for for sharing that because that is, I think is very helpful to to a lot of people. I mean, I think entertainment was part of your life from very early on. Mm-hmm. Did you ever want to do anything else? Was this one of your struggles as far as whether you wanted to entertain or not? Was well, when I was about, um, well, about 17 or 16 maybe, I, I had toyed with the idea of being a singer. And I was a folk singer. I was singing in folk clubs which were all built to the same design, a low roof, no ventilation, and filled with cigarette smoke. Yes. And I used to get incredibly nervous going on stage. But I worked with some wonderful folk artists in Ireland. You know, on a Friday evening after school, I'd be in the car down to Dublin. Um, There's a song about the rocky road to Dublin, and in those days it was absolutely correct. (laughs) I I learned how to put on my makeup in the dark with no mirror. Which has been a, like a real incredible gift to me through my life. <laughs> I, I can't make up at home now. I have to do it in the car. car. <laughs> but, you know, I, I did. I learned so much during those. Uh, it was a couple of years when I would do that. Mm-hmm. But I thought, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And I went back to my original ambition, which was to be a, a teacher. I always wanted to teach. First it was ballet. Then it was music, then it was music in English. And I was about to sit my A-levels and I had applied to go to teacher training college. And I'd let go of that if you like. I just felt, well, that's not for me. And a television producer remembered me from the Irish National Song Contest where they pick their entrant for Eurovision. Yes. I'd taken part the year before in 69. That's right. Meanwhile, I'd retired. And he remembered me and he called up and said, I have a little song, I think it would suit you, would you sing it? And I had to get permission from my school for me to take part because we were so close to A-levels. Mm. And, uh, and then, of course, that changed my life completely. Absolutely. Although, you know, Doug, I've, I have found a litmus test for me. If something happens or a door opens that I have not been searching for, and actually, I would not choose myself. Yes. I have to really give it consideration. <laughs> Could this possibly be God? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so anybody listening or watching, just when those moments come and you think, there is no way I would ever do this. <laughs> Just take a little moment and say, do you know, if this happens to be you, could you please? Yeah. <laughs> could 
confirm this in some right. way, because I have found that so often in my life. When I let go, yeah. he moves on. Again, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head there, don't you? That that, that is the way we need to develop. Because if we struggle, if we try and do it, um, it's never going to work. But you let go, you, you, you let God come through. And were you disappointed? I mean, because the year before, as you say, you came second in the National Irish Song. Because were you disappointed that you didn't win that year? I was praying that I wouldn't. Oh well, so you weren't disappointed. I was absolutely petrified, Doug. I stood. We, we had to stand in a line at the top of the program and sing little snippets from previous Eurovision winners. Yeah. And I was singing Poupée de Sira, which had won, I think, from France or somewhere. It must have been France or some French-speaking country. <laughs> I was so petrified. I was about to dash for the studio door. Luckily, the man beside me had a nervous habit of rubbing his <laughs> thigh. <laughs> and I just, it just caught my attention. Yeah. And suddenly I had to sing. Same. In fact, I've told him many years later, but for the fact you were scratching your leg, <laughs> I would have had no career. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's funny. We were sitting watching the votes coming in. And I know that every other artist was praying for votes. And I was saying, oh, God, don't let me win. <laughs> because I knew I couldn't hack it. Yes. If I had gone to sing in Eurovision, I would have died of fright. Right. You know, it wasn't my time. Right, right. But what did change during that year? Well, during that year, I, I just knew I didn't want a singing career. <laughs> I just couldn't breathe in right. these folk clubs. <laughs> And putting on your makeup in a rocky road in the dark, I mean, it wasn't glamorous. Right. So I thought, no, I don't want this. I want to be a teacher. But I, I, I truly believe that it was God's plan for me. Yeah. If I'd gone to that Eurovision with every bit of my being longing to win, yeah. I don't think I would have been able to give the performance I did. Right. But I went there believing that I would never do anything like that again in my life. My greatest thrill of that contest was me meeting Mary Hopkins. Yeah. Because I love Mary Hopkins. And I met her and I saw all these wonderful, fabulous, glamorous stars. And I went on. I remember talking to myself before I went on to sing. And I said, do not screw this up. <laughs> do not get nervous in the middle of this song. You've got three minutes. And it was very matter of fact and, you know, you'll never do this again. And I think that gave me the, um, the peace and calm to go and do it. Right. And once I came off, I didn't care who won. Right. I wasn't even watching the votes. But of course, as they say, the rest is history. Our own Dana has won the Eurovision Song Contest. Eurovision Song Festival, Oh, isn't this marvelous? And now presenting her with her prize, Lenny Coeur, who was one of the four winners last year and sang the song The Troubadour. She was the Netherlands entry. Oh, this is wonderful. When I heard I was going to Amsterdam, I thought it would be too good to be true that I should be here when Ireland would win. And it really has happened. And Derry Lindsay and Jackie Smith, they're absolutely thrilled, I'm sure, congratulating Dana. This is certainly a great night for the Irish. And now, once more, all kinds of everything, sung triumphantly this time by our own Dana. Snowdrops and buffaloes, butterflies and bees, sailboats and fishermen, things of the sea, wishing wells, wedding bells, early morning dew. Your whole life changed that yeah. night. I mean, overnight, people that had never heard of you heard of you. I think you had you know, the most amazing reception when, when, when oh, you got back Oh, it was incredible. Home. I mean, how did you feel? I mean, what do you remember about those days? I, I was in a total state of shock for about six months. Really, I was. Yeah. And we were living in what was known as the Bogside Flats. We were in the heart of the troubles. So there were many things that were uppermost in my mind. 
um, when we returned home and there were 5,000 people at the airport and the streets were lined into the Derry City Centre and I was carried shoulder high to the, the Guild Hall and I was looking out at these people who were beleaguered. They were absolutely beleaguered with the, the running battles in the streets and the threats and the fear and the anxiety. And I just remember thinking, this is the most wonderful thing that here we have both sides of our community yes. together, happy and celebrating yeah. what is really the essence of the people, yes. which is to sing music. Yeah. I mean, the theme song of my town is the, uh, the London Terry Air. Is it really? Yeah, well, Danny Boy. Yeah. It's named after my city. So it was wonderful, wonderful celebrations. And I mean, it was incredible. It was an incredible time. And I, I mean, I know because you, you moved on later and, and looked for peace, but you, it's, I am interested you, you, that you were able to look out over that crowd in all your celebration and your elation. elation you, you could see the, the, the coming together. Um, both sides of the divide. One, because of somebody else and, and, and something else. Yes, well... That must have been thrilling It was well. absolutely yeah. thrilling. And yeah. by that time, we had had two years of running street battles. Yes. You know, and uh, it was just wonderful, the celebration. When we arrived back at the flats. We lived on the fifth floor. And looking out over the balcony, I couldn't even speak. I was so tired. So this crowd of about two or three thousand people all sang to me. And you know, as I, as I came down, my mother made me sausage and chips, which I... <laughs> <laughs> They're all oh, celebrationary meal. <laughs> absolutely, it was fabulous. Sausage and chips, and we had... Uh, our house was filled with people, nobody could move, and yes. journalists, and we had two television crews, one from Spain and one from somewhere else, camped on the landing. Yeah. and. And I got into bed and it was just, you know when you, you know when you put your head on yes. your pillow? Yes. In your bed? I closed my eyes and I could hear the people in the street below singing all kinds of everything. And it was certainly one of those moments when you just feel, oh, this is so wonderful. Yeah. Are you still singing that today? I mean, on the tour? Do, yes. do, do, the people almost, I suppose, demand it of you, really. Yes. I yeah. went through a time when I... Um, I decided I wouldn't sing it anymore because I'm sure people must be sick of it, and so was I. Yes. And I had so many complaints. <laughs> <laughs> so I put it back in again. But yeah. almost on a daily basis, Doug, people share their memories yes. of that event and where they were, yeah. who they were with. Because yeah. it was the first time Ireland had ever won. Yes. And they really needed it. It was a real difficult time. Yeah. And they, they share their memories. And now it's like a little precious something we share. I'm really glad it wasn't a song like My Way, where you have to <laughs> bust a gut. Bust <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's really, it's, it's a lovely little song. To it suited you down to the ground, though, yeah, it, didn't it? Nice. It suited your personality. It suited you. It was almost, you could think, written for you. I yeah, mean, it's right a, a little folk go. song. Yeah. And it was written by two amateur writers. Really? Yeah, they were compositors in a Dublin know. newspaper. Yes, it was Amazing. an all amateur yeah. <laughs> event, yeah. I mean, that, as we said, changed your life and many things since then. But, um, and as great as that was, of course, w within a few years, you, you were having problems with your vocal cords. And yes. I, 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 one newspaper had headlines maybe that you would never sing again. I mean, yes. what was it like going through that? I mean, you've said two or three times already how much singing means to you and how. What was it like to face the possibility that you might never sing again? Initially, it happened very, very swiftly. And the, I had a growth on the cord, but I had had a little bit of problem the year before and irritating moments when my voice would be giving me trouble. And I thought it was nodules, which is a common complaint for singers who don't know how to protect their voice, which is if you like, like a little corn on the top of the cord and you can take it away like you'd pair a corn, yes. you know. But um, this was different. It was a, like a cyst, but with a root. Mm. But in my mind, it was 
that irritating little problem, I didn't realize there was this significant difference. So I went uh, see the, to see the doctor. I, I was actually promoting an, a song called Something's Cooking in the Kitchen, and I had had a run of very successful chart-topping singles. So I was very much in the media and in the news. So because of that, when I had to cancel, I was supposed to begin a tour the following day. Um, that was immediate news. Right. And I wasn't aware of the seriousness of the problem until I came around in the hospital and I saw a headline in the newspaper how serious it was and I thought, well, typical. <laughs> That's how you find Blowing out. Blowing <laughs> everything out of proportion. And then my, my consultant came in and explained to me, no, in fact, it was a very, very serious operation for a singer and it would be time before I knew if I'd be able to sing or not. In fact, I had to learn how to talk again. Wow. I wasn't able to uh, speak. I had to write everything down. Um, actually, it was a very um, popular time with some people. <laughs> I couldn't speak. But in all in all, it took me almost five years to get back to like a normal singing schedule. Yeah. So what was your faith like? during that time, did you lose your faith or did it strengthen your faith? Uh, how did that, you respond in that way? Well, at that time I was still in that one step forward and six steps back okay, period. Was, oh, right. And I couldn't pray that it would, my voice would be healed. And I thought that, that that was the perfect kind of response that I should have, you know? I shouldn't pray for that. I should wait and see what you know God had for me. But in actual fact, I, I realized, looking back on that time, it was because I didn't have the real assurance that there was a God there. And if I did pray for that and I didn't get healed, that in some way that would confirm those moments when, you know, when you'd be praying and all of a sudden, a little thought would race across the back of your head. There's nobody there. Yeah. And, and you'd kind of push it away. Those little thoughts that would confirm that there was nobody there. So I, I was, um, I was con absolutely convinced that I shouldn't pray to be healed. Right. And then I had attempts at comebacks. I was booked to do one of the biggest panto seasons in England, which was in the Manchester Uprise, which was the premier um, pantomime venue. And prior to that, I'd had other things, really wonderful things, a, a part in a US huge uh, television production where I was to sing um, an Irish song as an Irish immigrant. It was commemorating the famine and and it would, it would launch my career in the US. I was recording in the US. And I mean, so many things that I could not do. Unbelievable career opportunities. And I, I came in one day, there was nobody in the house except myself. And I, I walked in and there was a paper on the table. Dana cancels another comeback. And I just sat down at the table and I felt, I, I hit rock bottom. I'd heard that phrase so many times, you hit rock bottom. And you think many times in your life you've hit rock bottom until you hit rock bottom. <laughs> and I hit rock bottom. There was a feeling of helplessness. There was nothing I could do. I was the breadwinner in my family. My father had just had a major heart attack. And I had two younger brothers. And I just felt totally hopeless. Helpless and hopeless. And I did that classic moment. If there's anybody there, please help me. And I had an instant response. And not one I expected. And actually, I didn't even think it was a response. I wasn't praying. I was actually speaking from the very depth of my heart. But as I said earlier, I think that was the most perfect prayer I ever prayed. Yes. But isn't that what prayer is, isn't it? You know, we can have prayers which are written down and very eloquent and that, 
But in the end, it seems to me prayer is from my heart to God's heart. That's exactly what prayer is. It's a conversation. Yes, yeah. It's a conversation yeah. about really where you are. And like a conversation, you speak and then you listen. Yeah. Otherwise, it's a monologue. Yeah. And it is a conversation. That's what prayer is. Yeah. Your troubles, of course, weren't over at that point because you married and that wasn't a trouble. Are you saying that that was the start? <laughs> I just realised when I said that. I'm so glad that my husband is not here, but he'll watch this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I say worse things about my wife, so that's, that's the only comfort. But no, he, he was a hotelier and, of course, after... Um, I think a couple of years after you were married or, or so. One year. The, one year, the IRA bomb completely destroyed the hotel. Completely destroyed so, it, yes. Again, how did you feel then? Well, that was the seventh bombing or the sixth bombing. And I think by that time, and through Damien actually, uh, we, we had, I had certainly re reached a different level in my relationship with God. Mm. I... I, I knew without doubt that God was there. And I knew without doubt that whatever was happening and however difficult it was, and you don't lose your human fears and anxieties, but you learn to hand them over. I knew, and so did he, and that's the tremendous strength of having a husband or a man having a wife, that you're in tune spiritually yes. and we both we both know we are physical uh, emotional and spiritual beings yeah. and if you have a common ground on those three elements that make you up then really you have the tools to face anything yeah. in life yeah. so he would help me and I would help him and it was a devastating time because his hotel and his staff, they were like a family. Right. Many of the women had worked there, or the men had worked there for 30 years. Wow. So we were like a family. We were all huddled together, you know, watching this burn. And um, I, I wrote an autobiography recently, and I talked about that time and about the incredible... Um, for us, it was miraculous. You know, this hotel was devastatingly bombed. The roof fell through like three floors into the, the basement. But three floors up, perched on the remains of a wooden fireplace that had been burnt back to the wall, was a bust of Christ, half on and half off the ledge. There was nothing else there except this center wall, which was the, the chimney wall, and billowing smoke. And as it began to clear, the bust of Christ looked like it was suspended. Mm. And one of the firemen, against the fire chief's uh, advice, he said, take me up on the ladder because the wall could have collapsed. Yes. He said, that is really proof that there's a God. Mm. And he, he went up on the ladder and he lifted this and it was burnt, alabaster burnt back yeah. to the, whatever is the core of it. So it was like burnt and brown and crackled but all the features of Christ, and he brought it down, and people, we prayed and we wept. It was such a wonderful um, sign that no matter how terrible the evil or the attack or the moment, that Christ is still in the center. Amen. He is still there. Amen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was, oh, it was a wonderful, wonderful moment. Yeah. And for us, it was just a confirmation of what we knew. Right. In uh, the end of the 80s, you, you met the Pope, and then in the 90s, you go into politics. Now, many would think those two worlds just, just do not mix. So, did, did, you, did you take your hope and your Christian uh, belief into politics, or, 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 or did you have to sort of leave one behind to go into the no, other? No, I didn't want to go into politics. I mean... I definitely did not. There's another not. thing you didn't want to do. No, 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 I did not. But I was contacted by people who were very concerned that the Irish Constitution, which is a Christian constitution, it's, it's based on natural law, that everything we have comes from God. Mm. And it protects life 
from the moment of conception it protects the family based on the marriage of a man and woman and mm. and it places the importance of the parents above any law they ha ha must be protected and supported in ra raising their children and ma many wonderful elements within that uh, constitution that it was being eroded away and undermined mm. and they contacted me to ask, would I run for the presidency of Ireland? That's right. So I thought, well, they are definitely, to say the least, they are not sensible. They must be totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, absolutely not. But, you know, in, in, I've written about it in my book. Yeah. <laughs> because it's too complicated. You should complicated. have brought a copy, we could have held up at this point. It's too complicated to go into, but it's called all kinds of everything. Oh, yeah, what, what a surprise, yes. That's <laughs> what my life has been. But, you know, um, I, I knew that I wouldn't win. Yeah. But I knew that I had a public platform, a high profile, and that I had the opportunity to speak for people who would otherwise be brushed under the carpets because if I said it it would be reported on mm -hmm. and I also knew when you raise your head above the parapet you're going to get shot at and I was but um, it was an amazing uh, adventure and challenge just my family just my family we took on the whole political system and I became the first independent ever to receive a nomination to run for the presidency in the history of the country. And I came third place. I beat out the third biggest party in the country and came, I took almost 14% of the national vote. Wow. Wow. So it was, it shook the political system to its roots. And two years later, I was elected as a member of the European That's Parliament. Right, yeah. So it was incredible. And you stood for family values. You, you stood for things which obviously have been instilled into you all, all, oh, yes. all, all your yes. life. Common and, sense. And, and, yeah, but I mean, what that seems to say is there are so many people that are thinking these other parties are not giving what we were. And, and you certainly stood up and, and you stood up and as you say, you fought your corner and, and you actually went against some of the other authorities by speaking very clearly at what you believe and, oh, yes. and still do today. I, I, believe. I mean, you're still doing, you know, campaigning for various... Uh, yes, I'm you know, not an elected yeah. politician anymore. No, that's right. I'm not in, in elected no, that's right. politics. Yeah, no. But um, yes, you know, there's a silent majority that is so aware that especially parents, I think, are terribly conscious that the values you try to teach your child and the protections that you put around your child, when you open your door and that child steps outside of your home and they don't even have to step outside, you just switch on your television or your radio and they are bombarded with a hostile society that is undermining the values and the beliefs and the protections that you are desperately struggling to put around your child and your family. And it, it is a battlefield. It is a battlefield. And it's not accidental. It is definitely an agenda. And it's terribly hard to have to realize that. It's not a conspiracy theory. Just anybody who really thinks about it knows that that is the truth. We have a society hostile to our beliefs and to our values. Mm. Here you are then, back now and gone full circle, back into the entertainment world. I think a gospel tour being planned uh -huh. for next year. Um, planning a 40th anniversary tour, yes. I, I think, as well. Isn't this world of entertainment a little more unreal? <laughs> than the things we've been talking about? Or is there something that even as you go out on stage tonight and you sing and, and you share your heart, is it unreal or are you able to put a reality just for a short while in, into those people's hearts and lives? Well, I think that the tremendous similarity for me between the world of politics and show business and even private life it all revolves around your relationship with people, how you feel about people. And I've always loved 
being with people, I'm, I'm interested in people, and, and I often spend more time at the end of a concert speaking to people than I do actually on the stage. And, and they know that I love them. They know that. And, and we have fun, and uh, I like to laugh, and, you know, I, I don't... If I'm doing a, what I call a commercial, a secular concert, yes. then that's what I do. And a gospel concert is not that entirely different, except perhaps you may have specific... Uh, uh, songs, but I, I, you know, I always include uplifting, yes. inspirational songs. Yes. Or you may share more of yourself on a deeper one. level yes. that you can in a gospel setting. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I love uh, that. It's never been about just getting up and singing and the applause for me. Never. Right. It's always been about that relationship with people, and. And that's the heart of, of Christianity, isn't it? Yeah. It's your relationship yeah. with your neighbor. That's right. And, and, and I'm, I'm so aware, you know, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. We are. Yes. You know, so if I go out, I don't need to be really scared. That's my family out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have our little tips. Yeah. But, you know, that's my family out there. Yeah. I, I love that. You know, having so much fame that you've had and doing so much, you, you still seem so real you know you, you 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 can see other people and you think well you know they're a bit unreal because of all they've been through it seems to me that the reality of of christ and your faith still continues to come through in whatever you're doing whether it was in politics whether it's in singing whether it's in the gospel tour whatever it, it seems that that reality is is still coming through you you are what you are Yes. Are, 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 you, are you aware of that? Are you aware of the, the naturalness of what God has done within you? Sort of I don't. Flowing out? I, I can't objectively look at myself. Yeah. You know, I, I always remember, even as a young girl, um, when I first started singing, when I was about 15 or 16 as a folk singer, someone saying to me, well, who are you like? You know, are you the new uh, Julie Felix? Are you, new the, are you the new this or that? And, and I say, no, I'm me. And I've always been afraid of being one thing on the outside and another thing on the inside because that leads to terrible personal conflict yes. and it can lead to depression where the person you are inside is almost guarded and hidden and then you have this outward um, protective shell but it isn't actually protective. It, it actually cuts the real you away. And so I've always been conscious that I never wanted that in my life. So I've always tried to be myself. And of course, you know, that doesn't mean that if I'm feeling annoyed, I'm going to shout and beat your, you know, <laughs> beat your face off. No. But, you know, I do, I do try to be myself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, think that's a, I think that's so great because what you are comes through and, and, and who you are. And therefore, because you have this deep faith in your life, that comes through in whatever you do. And, 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 and that, it, you, you seem to have done that in all, all parts of your life. It, but is there any part of your life, anything, that you really are, are so... Yeah, I remember that. That is a memory that I will treasure forever. Is there any one thing or, because of your life, there are many things like that? There are many things like that. I think the things that, when I come to that moment when I'm leaving this life, yeah. they'll always be the very personal, my children, those moments, my husband. Those are the ones that really, really count. Yeah. But there are, there are so many moments, and, and I would say that it's, I'm an ongoing work. I know that. I, I describe it as, I feel like sometimes like I'm an onion. And every time I think I've, I've dealt with that, perhaps, problem in my personality or struggle that I've got or you know, laying to rest and forgetting something that's happened, and I think, oh, thank goodness. Then it's like God peels away another layer of an onion and he just reveals to you something else inside of you that you really need to work on and you need to be aware of. And like every layer of an onion, 
you cry. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> because all the time he's just taking us down to our yeah. essence. Because yeah. he wants us to be at peace from the very essence yeah. of our being yeah. uh, until, you know, we meet him. Yeah. And that for me is an ongoing journey and work. I mean, it is work. Yeah. But when those, when that, when that situation, whatever it is, where he feels that, when you work your way through that and, and you're with him, it is another uh, deepening of your peace yes. and your trust yeah. as you move on. Right. But it's an ongoing yes. work. But you work together. Yeah. And it's looking at those difficult times, isn't it? And seeing that God means them for good. We can't react because it says in Scripture that he disciplines his children. But it's for our good. Yes. And you know, we do have difficult times. We do have hard times. And yet God works through that to actually create more of himself in us. So as we come out of that, there's something more, isn't there? Yes, I think you've explained that really well. And he does say he refines us. Right. He refines us. And a wonderful thing that Damien um, has really taught me, and, and we do it, through gritted teeth sometimes, we do it, when you think nothing else can possibly go wrong, and it does, yes. in that moment, to say, I thank you for this. I do not understand it, and I certainly do not want it. <laughs> I do not want it. But I thank you for this. Yeah. That, that is the most empowering moment, yeah. because that's when you surrender. And you really do acknowledge that God does know yeah. ultimately what is for our betterment. Yeah. Maybe not in that moment. So for those little moments, I pass that on because it has been a lifeline for me. Right. And we have come through some very, very so difficult right. moments and very, very difficult times, yes. as everybody has. Yes. In that moment, just say, I thank you for this. Yes. I don't understand it. I don't want it. But I thank you for this. And I promise you that there will be a, a, a beginning, an improvement, a peace, and you'll move forward. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you got a, a particular Bible passage or Bible verse that God has used for you and met you with o over the years? Is, is there anything particular now, that comes I, to mind? I have quite a number of ones that are all fitting through my mind. And now the minute you ask me, my mind goes <laughs> totally to spaghetti. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> I will tell you that there are so, so many, but I'm, I'm not good at remembering scripture and verse. And, um, but there's one where he, he walks, justice walks in his, uh, his footsteps, yes. justice follows him. Yes, and, right, yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's, it's, the end of, that. good, good, it's the end of Psalm 23. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days, all of, the my days life, of my and life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yes, I think, you know, once... Once you know and you accept that there is truly a God and you ask him, if you're not sure, you just say, please, you know, let me know you. Yeah. Yeah. And you have that knowledge. Then only goodness and peace can follow you. Only goodness and mercy can yeah. follow you yeah. because you're with him. Amen. And he's already won the battle. Yes. That's the wonderful thing. Amen. Yeah. One final thing, and I'll let you go, because I think sound check time's coming up in the evening show. But if there was one thing that you could still do in your life, is there one thing, what would it be? What would you really still say, Lord, if I could achieve this before I go to be with you, what, what would that be? I'd like to be a good mother. It's a very interesting answer. Of all the things you could do, it's, it, it's, that, it's back to that relationship again, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, and that's, that's my vocation. Yeah. That's yeah. what I would like to be, a good mother and wife. Yeah. And wife.
I think you are. I, 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 I can't see you not being. I'm, Can I'm you write saying. that down and sign it? I, I and will. I will give it to I've Damien. Said, I've said it on television. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the interview. And, and thank you for sharing your heart which you have done. Oh, uh, it's so know. lovely I, to see I, you I, again. Yeah, it's blessed you. Do you think Thank we you. can meet again and not leave it 37 years? I don't think we should leave it 37 years somehow. Well, in that case, OK. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed that. And uh, the team as well, we were watching it again. And I just want to say uh, to Dana again, thank you so much for sharing your heart. It's so great to hear somebody that's been through all of that and yet still their trust is in God, still their trust uh, is in the living God and all that he has done and we really appreciate the time uh, that Dana gave uh, to us there. Um, I, we, we can open the phone lines but first of all I'm going to speak on the phone to uh, Chris, Chris Gidney. Uh, good evening Chris. Hello. How, How are, are you, you doing? I'm great. I'm uh, very jealous of that lovely blue tie you have on this evening. Very yeah. nice. But <laughs> could, could, I, um, could I borrow that please? Y yeah, you, you, any time you like. <laughs> Chris, let, let, I better explain. Chris is uh, a head of uh, Christians in Entertainment, and uh, we've got to know him over the years. And he kindly arranged that uh, interview with Dana. Chris, how did you get Dana back onto the stage? Well, wasn't that thrilling? I mean, she's been away from us nearly twenty years. That's right. And so it was a, an absolute thrill. Um, I don't know, really. It was just one of those things. That I suddenly thought, well, where is Dana? What is she doing? Why isn't she entertaining us? And, and how much we miss her? So um, I put in a call and we had some conversations and um, there she was. Great, great. And you, uh, of course, you, the, the, we, as we said at the beginning, it was this magical tour uh, with Don McLean uh, and Jimmy Cricket as well. And there will be, we'll be showing interviews with them as, uh, at a later date. How, how did the tour go? How did folks respond to them? Um, it, it went really well. I mean, it's been a credit crunch year, of course, so getting people into the theatre when they have so much choice and so little money um, is always a difficult thing. But uh, I, I'm very grateful that we had several sellout um, venues on the tour. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was great to see God's gift of music and comedy just reaching into commercial audiences' hearts and minds and just helping them to forget their troubles. And, you know, that, that, for, that for me is what it's all about. It, it is, and, and, and as you said it there, it, 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 it is God's gift. I mean, and certainly for, for, for Dana, uh, I mean, the gift that she has of expressing that and, and with the grace and, the, and, and, and all the charm uh, that she has. And as you say, that can touch hearts. Uh, that, that can meet people uh, where, where they are and where, where it's needed. Yeah, I firmly believe that. I remember when I years ago when I when I was allowed to preach, they, they don't let me preach anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, I was always worried about preparing a sermon and thinking, how, you know, all these different people, how am I going to meet the needs? And I remember reading something about, well, that's not your problem. The Holy Spirit will Amen. touch each of individual heart um, as as the Holy Spirit sees fit. And and I know that works in a church, and I'm convinced that that works in. Uh, a commercial theatre setting as well. When you put someone who is uh, a Christian on the stage, you know, he, they don't have to uh, uh, mention God. The very fact that they are there delivering their gift, their God-given gift, you know, God will use it. It will touch that person through the music or through what they say. And particularly for this tour, it was fantastic because we finished the show with I Believe, you know. Um, right. I, I was going to sing it for you then, yeah. but I changed my mind. <laughs> Is um, your voice <laughs> any better than mine? <laughs> a great commercial song but with some very deep spiritual meaning to it you know um, and um, it was great to have three Christians on stage in a commercial show in commercial venues in front of uh, you know the man woman and child on the street singing together I believe yes. and, and we had several standing ovations uh, after they sang that and uh, I, I think that's because 
not only was it a good song and a good show and uh, good personalities, but there's a spiritual element to what they did on stage. Yeah, that 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 song actually means so much to me. We we had a well, he wasn't really an uncle, but we called him an uncle when he was young. And every Christmas we used to get together with an accordion, and he you know oh. would play. And and his and and his. Uh, song, his real piece was "I Believe," and and I've loved it ever since then. I, I have to right. say, and I, I'm so sorry I missed gonna... it. If I'd have known they were singing that, I'd have stayed to the end. <laughs> yeah, well, we can fix up you uh, your your own tour. How about that? The "I Believe" tour. Don't I, I absolutely. Believe tour. Chris, you're on. <laughs> watch out, watch out, London Palladium. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, well, no, let, let's start somewhere. The O2, at least, Chris. Come on, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now, I, I, I think uh, pr- progress is being made for Dana's 40th anniversary tour, and also for a gospel concert next year. Yes, it is. Uh, I mean, you mentioned the work that I'm involved in called Christians in Entertainment, which this year celebrates 27 years of, of looking after people in showbiz. Right. We, we do, the, the charity doesn't actually produce these shows. This is uh, my commercial company called That's Entertainment Productions. Right. Um, uh, which uh, produces the, the tours. And, and uh, if, if I can use Christians on the tours because they're good at what they do, then, then I will do that. Hence the last tour with Donna and, and our ongoing work with her. And that also gives me the opportunity to do um, a gospel tour uh, next uh, May, uh, which is in, in the planning stages at the moment. And we, we actually do take quite a lot of different celebrities into churches because it means that people on the street look at this uh, poster outside and go, wow, Jimmy Cricket's in that church yeah. on Saturday night. <laughs> or Sid Little's in that church yeah. on Friday. Yeah. Oh, good. I'll have to go and have a look at that. And we get people into the church who've, who've not been there for, for years and years and years because they're just intrigued as to know why a celebrity would be in a church. And so we're, we're, we're taking Donna on this church tour next year, which coincides with the 40th anniversary right. of her win of Eurovision. So it's good timing. Good. And, and I think if folks uh, want to get more information or would like to consider uh, something, uh, sort of something for, from you, they can get on your website, Christians in Entertainment? That's it. They can. And if they just type, type into a search in, engine, Christians Entertainment, it will pop up there and uh, all the information as to how to contact yeah. uh, us and, and uh, is there. So um, we'd be delighted to answer any questions anybody has. Yeah, and if they can't get through, if they get through to us here at Revelation, we'll make sure uh, we pass them on to you. Um, That'd be fantastic. Yeah, and, I, and I, I hope, because we've talked about doing some more work with you, and I hope we, we might be able to, uh, uh, to bring some more of this information through uh, to, uh, to, to our viewers in, in, in the near future. Because you, uh, I mean, I'm not sure we would film this, but you work, of course, with quite a lot of people, some well-known, some not so well-known, but who are Christians in that field. And I, I think your ministry is very much one of encouragement and helping them to stand isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, it's not always easy being a Christian in any uh, walk of life, but in the entertainment business, you're so often um, uh, in the public eye. Um, and uh, probably a half of the people that I meet with individually to talk about God are not Christians, but they want to, to talk about God, but they don't want the information uh, you know, pasted across to some newspaper. So there's a, an aspect of, of our work which I call the Nicodemus sort of work, which is that bloke in the Bible who came to Jesus in the middle of the night to talk to him about God. And, uh, and so we do that. We, we, we meet uh, uh, and uh, talk to, uh, when we're invited to meet with celebrities, we, we talk with them quite regularly about God and in confidence. And yeah. um, so that's good. But for others, it's, it's a case of support and encouraging them to... to remain a Christian voice in in what is a very influential media, really, and that's why you're where you are. Doug. That's right. And Chris, I, I may may God continue to uh, to strengthen because I know you travel uh, many hundreds of miles uh, uh, over the year. May God continue to strengthen you and continue to use you uh, in, in in such an important role that you have. 
Well, thank you, and you too, and, and yeah. I really hope that one day you'll love me enough to give me your nice blue tie. <laughs> well, we should be meeting up soon, and, and if I get my wife's permission, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Fantastic. I look forward to that. I'll be in touch, Chris. Thanks very much for coming on tonight. Thanks, thanks for having me. Take Bless care, you Bye. Good night. Uh, and we're joined now by uh, Michael. Good evening, Michael. Good evening, uh, Doug. How are you tonight? Ah, uh, not bad, you know. A what, bit, huh? What would you like to share with us? Actually, I wanted to ask you two things, if, you know, if you know. Tell me, are there any women angels or, or in heaven? Um, in actual fact, angels are neither male nor female. So there, are not, there aren't any women angels, but there aren't any men angels either, because angels aren't man or woman as we know them to be. Oh. So uh, is, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's one of the questions. Good. Uh, What's the your other, other one? one? I was watching the news last night. Sorry? I was watching the news last night. Uh-huh. And it says they discovered a new bird. Like a jumbo jet, you know, as big as a jumbo jet, something like that, you know. Right. 250 million years old. Yes? Yeah, that's it. I, now, it, it what, is little... it, what does that mean? Are they right? Are we wrong? Is the Bible wrong? Or who is right? Well, I think, I think it's interesting to ask a few questions. Always with these discoveries, um, information comes out quite quickly, and then they have to think it through. The question always that you ask yourself is yes. how do they know it's 250 million years old? And so you have to look at the way that they date yes. that uh, and, and, and look at that from, from, well, from that sure perspective. Well, I'm sure they have means to check the, these things out, isn't it? Yeah, but from that point of view, uh, it, 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 they can check it out and according to their understanding, but it hasn't got a date stamp on of when it was made. And so there are several factors that you take in, and some that were dated at 250 oh. million, some would take exactly the same factors and, and, and dated at a few thousand years old. So I would say watch this space, Michael. <laughs> okay. Good to hear from you. Okay. okay. Kali Nikta. <laughs> Anne. Good evening, Anne. Good Hello, evening. Anne. Good evening. How are you tonight? <clears throat> I'm just on to ask you a question, if you would help me, please. Ah, uh, if I can, I will try. Well, I am a Christian. Uh-huh. And I'm an old lady, I'm 85. And I've just come out of hospital after having a, a leg repla a hip replacement. Okay. And my son, who comes, can come to see me once or twice, but today he brought me a form to fill in. And, well, he filled it in, I couldn't, and he filled it in. But I think there was one or two exaggerations in it because it was a form to get help, to get somebody to come in and help me. Okay. But I don't want to have me lie about it, but he said no. He said he maybe exaggerated a little bit things, but I can't sleep because... It's just on my mind. And am I very wrong? Should I ring him and tell him to cancel it? Okay. The thing is this. If you feel uncomfortable about what's written on that form, don't sign it. Because you must feel comfortable about what's there. And if you deserve the help, whether it's exaggerated or, or not, in other words, if it's not exaggerated, you will get that help. But you must follow your conscience, Anne. Uh, okay, Anne's gone, but do follow your conscience and, 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 and don't sign the form if you feel there are exaggerations on there. Talk it over with your son and make sure that it's, uh, that, that it's put right. Um, Ruth now. Good evening, Ruth. Good evening. What can I we do like for to you? I speak to Doug. Good evening, Doug. Hi there. Hi. It's been a pleasure, really, seeing you on the on the, uh, the screen with Donna. Uh -huh. I remember I was just a few years older than Donna. Right. And I used to really loathe in her singing. I used to love it. Yeah. Because I had just been married and I was a very, very young mother then. And um, I really enjoy seeing her on the screen again. I thought she had disappeared. Yeah. Whatever happened to Donna? Well, as we, as you saw in the interview, uh, she 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 gave up show business. Really, she she went into politics. She. What I uh, noticed. 
Yeah, and now she, but now she came back. This was her first year back on stage after about 20 yeah. years. Ah, it's the Lord that brought her back because yeah. she's got such a beautiful voice. Oh, she it's has. a voice that you don't hear a lot these days. Right. Yeah, I know. So anyway, thank you so much, Doc, for that program. Okay, bless you. And uh, we hope we might be able to do a bit more uh, with regard to the gospel tour, etc., uh, later on so watch this space if we we might be able to bring you some more bless you um I, i've got somebody here that's not quite as happy uh, uh w- with that interview it's from aj and aj says that he's quite shocked to see doug harris interviewing a prominent catholic um i see this as another promotion of catholicism um i wonder Uh, AJ, um, how that could promote Catholicism. You have said uh, that uh, Dana is a prominent Catholic, but the whole way through that, she was sharing her faith. She was sharing her relationship, and she wasn't sharing about you've got to become a Catholic. She was sharing about her relationship with her living God. Um, Dana is on the Catholic Channel, maybe. And adheres fully to the Catholic faith, which it goes contrary to the true biblical faith. Uh, again, depending on what you mean, I would agree with you. I do believe there are certain things about Catholicism uh, that would not be um, clearly go along with the, the, the biblical stance that I would take. But again, I have to say, not one of those things was mentioned in that interview. And I have to say, from the moment we met her to the moment we left her, there was nothing in that dressing room but a sense of peace, a sense of joy, and a sense of presence of the Lord. I, that's all I can say. And I will say what I've always said, uh, and, and that is this that there are many Catholics who really know the Lord, just as there are some Catholics that don't, some Anglicans that don't, some Methodists that don't, some Baptists that don't know the Lord. They just call themselves that. There are others um, that um, uh, do. You see it sad to see the channel compromising and not standing up for the Bible's authority. I find it very difficult, AJ. I, I hear what you're saying, and that's why I'm reading it out. But I would like to, to, to ask you where in that interview was there compromise? Where in, in, in that interview uh, was there anything that was not biblical? Um, and so, uh, yeah, bless you. You obviously do have that feeling. Uh, but all I can say is those of us that met her and those of us that shared with her would have uh, a, a different um, uh, idea. Uh, and this is, um, hi Doug, wonderful program, uh, and uh, they, they've asked for prayer. Yes, we will pray, uh, Kevin and, and Joy, uh, and I'm really glad that you enjoyed the program. And indeed, uh, as Chris was saying there, uh, it was amazing and how some of the audiences really did uh, react uh, to them. And, and of course, uh, Don and, and uh, Jimmy Cricket are uh, absolute comics, and uh, so they're so different uh, to Dana, but all three together um, really did bring over something of God's spirit and God's uh, love and uh, joy. Um, and so that's, um, uh, well, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, hi. Um, we got, we're joined on the line by Bill. Good evening, Bill. Hi, hi Doug. How you doing? Uh, fine. I've never talked on this channel before. Well, there's always a first time. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Just what, what the, sorry, what the last gentleman said. Yeah. Um, surely there's no denominations in heaven, are there? Amen. There, there and, are only true Christians, aren't there? And if we're keeping the law, as it were, I know we're under grace, we should be celebrating the Shabbat on uh, Saturday, shouldn't we? If we're keeping the law, we should be. Yes. <laughs> I'm not saying we're not saved by the law. Of no, exactly, and we're not saved by the law. We're we're, we're saved by grace, um, and there was there are some uh, that feel they should still keep the Shabbat on Saturday. In fact, this weekend. Um, I'll be up with my sister in uh, up in the north of England, and we will be going to a Messianic assembly uh, on the Saturday, and I'll be sharing there. But normally, I would meet with my fellowship on a Sunday. Yeah, um, really what I want to talk to you is, um, 
when I was baptised, I forgot the first li- the first lines of my um, speech, as it were. You know, I thought it was very spiritual if you didn't write it down. And of course it started, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for those who believe. But I forgot the next two lines, and I know you know them. So it said, say, say the first line again. I'm not ashamed of the, of gospel, the gospel, for it's the power of God for those who believe. For those who believe. And the next two lines are, um, good, first good. to the Jew... Yes, and the Gentile, yeah. And also the Gentile. Yes, indeed, that's I, that's I'm in Romans. Of, yeah. I'm one of those people who want to know why the church isn't going to the Jewish people. Why should we go to the Jewish people? I believe it's the key to salvation to go to the Jew first. I believe it is the scriptural way. Okay, and and I, I accept what you're saying there, and certainly it does talk to the Jew first in the context of Romans. Uh, it's talking that because he is writing to the Gentiles, and the gospel, of course, did come to the Jews first. I am not sure I would agree with you that we always need to go to the Jew first. In that sense, we do need to have an open heart towards them. I believe we should be praying for them, but I don't think that necessarily means in my area, I can't preach to the Gentiles before I've preached to the Jews. No, I'm not saying that, but if, sorry. Yeah, carry on. It's it's difficult to get the screen and the um, sound together. I, <laughs> uh, um, I mean, uh, Rabbi Paul of Tarsus. Yeah. Um, although he was apostle to the Gentiles, he went to the Jewish people first. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I agree. And I'm one of these people with w- the church, the Gentile church, is praying for a world revival, and but we're not going to the Jew first. Well, uh, that's a fast exaggeration because there are many parts and we've had many people on the program here that part of Gentile churches that are moving out into uh, Jewish communities and so yes whereas there's some that are not doing it many are and so you know praise God uh, for that and Bill you continue to uh, to move on in that way and yes encourage us to do that and may we all be encouraged to move on uh, in the truth and the reality of what the Lord shares with us. Yeah, well, I, th- I think the final point is that um, many believers pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you know, give to the Jewish people, yeah. which is scriptural, um, but what is the greatest gift that a Jewish person can receive? Yep, Jesus Christ himself as Messiah, and yeah. many are sharing that. With. I, I had Jacob on here the other night, uh, last week, who who does that faithfully? So, bless you, Bill. Thank yes. you, thank, thank you, you for your much. point. Okay, bless you now. Um, I've got another caller, and I didn't quite catch the name. Uh, Paul. Paul. Good evening, Paul. Hi, mate. How you doing? I'm all right. How you doing? Good. I'm missing your waistcoats, though. Uh, I don't wear waistcoats. I only wear waistcoats on my Simply the Truth show. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. If I'd have known you wanted one, I'd have brought a spare one with me. <laughs> okay. What, what I wanted to talk to you about was um, I, I've recently got into, um, like, apologetics and the whole idea of, you know, witnessing to, to people, especially those people who know a little bit about, about scriptures already, yep. but who, who, who don't quite share, share the same idea of who Jesus Christ is and, yep. uh, and the salvation plan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I'm talking here about obviously Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, and Mormons, right? And um, one one of, one of the key things that um, I thought I had sort of sewn up and, and bagged up is the whole idea of um, uh, faith based salvation. Now I've, I've read everything in Ephesians um, two eight nine etc. and obviously Romans um, four three through to five um, etc. etc. and basically the whole of Romans basically. Um, and, I, and I'm quite sort of comfortable with what what Paul is saying there. And we're like, oh, I'm going to the, um, the epistle of James. And um, where it, it, where I read, um, obviously, the bit that faith without works is dead, yeah. I, I was quite comfortable with that uh, also, because obviously for me, um, where, where Paul is talking about um, what, how, how, you know, how to be saved in, in Ephesians and in Romans, um, James seems to be talking about what a saint, saved man looks like. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, if uh, you're not saved by works, but you're saved to do works, and I think that's how we Orthodox Christians um, explain 
explain the two situations. Um, but then when I got to James 2.24, yeah. it kind of like shook me a little bit because... Um, so can we, we're, we're running a bit out of time. Can we get to the point, uh, Paul? Yeah, the, basically 2.24 basically says that you're not saved by works, you're saved by... Um, so you're not saved by faith alone, you're saved by works. So I, I just wanted to know, how, how does that fit with what every, every, how everything Paul says? I, I don't actually think... Uh, I'm just tr- trying to bring it up in my mind, but that whole passage in James 2 um, doesn't actually... Because James 2.24 uh, says, So you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Now that's not talking about salvation... That's right. talking about being justified. And you can't take that one verse out of everything else because what Paul, uh, what James is saying um, in, in that passage is this. If you have faith, it will be shown. Exactly. If you have faith, it will be seen. And right. so from that point of view, um, you, and, and he actually quotes the person in there that says, I've got faith, therefore, but I'm not going to show it. And he says that's not possible. So what right. James goes on to say is this, that justification, yes, is by faith, but that faith will be expressed by works. And you can't, right. you, you ha- if you've got faith, then that, that will be expressed. And so justification comes that way as well. But it's got nothing to do, it doesn't say justification is by works alone, it is by faith, but it is that faith expressed in what we do. But what's the difference then between salvation and um, justification? Uh, justification? Justification is God saying you, you, you are righteous and I will treat you as such. Salvation, of course, is an overall term. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will finally be saved. And so um, salvation is, is, is what Christ does within us. Justification is God. Uh, and in fact, we, as we are saved, we are then justified because that's what Romans actually says. Paul, I, I, I can't actually, I, if, you want, if you want to carry on this conversation, do ring me back on Sunday evening at 10.30 or ring David Winter in a minute on Voice in the Wilderness. Um, I'll gladly carry that conversation on a little bit more then. Right. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot for your help. Bless you. Thanks a All lot. Right. Um, well, I'm either blessing people or, or really upsetting them tonight. And, and I, I'm a little sad, actually, because here again uh, we have Nathan on uh, saying, surprised and sad to see you playing footsie with a devoted Roman Catholic. Do you know, I did not interview Dana as a devoted Roman Catholic. I interviewed Dana as somebody who loved the Lord, who had experienced the Lord and wanted to share that. And, 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 and I find that, that there is a time, I, as you know, I, I agree with all those who type that I do not believe in the dogma of Rome. But as I've said, and it's in, for those who've known me for years, it's in my notes uh, that I've been writing for years and years. And that is this. Yes, it is possible there are, because there are many Catholics that have come to a true relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not up, not up for me to tell them to leave the church. It's up for me to encourage them and, and, and whatever. And if that person really knows the Lord, what right have I to say to them, I will not fellowship with you doesn't mean to say I agree with all of their doctrine now that is to be um, uh, completely um, contrasted with this text that came in I don't know when I enjoyed a program so much as I did watching and listening to Dana she is so full of love the Holy Spirit is living in her and shining out of her I have a lot of faith but tonight was Brill, God bless. I tell you, that there, there's the difference. And I'm saddened if because we didn't deal with Catholicism. And I'm saddened if you didn't see coming out of Dana that love, that grace shining forth from her. And yes, we might disagree on doctrine. I'm sure we would disagree on some areas of doctrine. 
but I have to say um, uh, uh, that, 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 that uh, it, it was so different. Here again, <laughs> uh, this is from, from Beverly. Um, I must admit, I saw the EPG, that's the, the notes on uh, uh, that the electronic programming uh, that's on, uh, uh, on um, uh, Sky, and I did not think I wanted to watch, but God had other ideas. I was totally blessed. Thank you, Doug. Uh, blessings. I'm sorry, w- was that another caller to somebody saying my... Yes. Hello? Good evening. Hello. He's gone. Hello. Oh, hello. No, you're still there. Yeah, I'm here. Great. Hey, uh, we got a couple of minutes for you. What would you like to share? Um, I, w- I suppose you could say I'm a bit of a sceptic, um, but I have been... Uh, I've, I've been... I don't know, I've had a period in my life where I've had a, an awakening, if you like. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to describe it, and I don't know what to do with this feeling. I just wonder if you have any advice before I commit by actually going to a church. It, 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 what I what I would suggest is you look around at local churches and you see one where you feel at home, where you feel um, it, it's good and it's right, good biblical teaching, teaching. And you go along there. You don't have to commit straight away. Go along, yeah. see what's happening in, in the family atmosphere and, and, and be involved. It, yeah. it, if you need to, to talk more on that, do, do come back to me at the office because I, we, it's very difficult to, uh, to talk through all the details of that just at the moment. But uh, yeah. if you want to, do ring me on uh, next week at the, uh, the uh, there's the office number up on the screen. No, it's not. Yeah, there's the office number up on the screen. Um, uh, 0208 972 And be glad to, to talk with you further on that. Okay, bless you. Um, uh, hi, Doug. Uh, you've talked about this before. Well, uh, there are so many... I, I I don't. I suppose when I get on, everybody wants to talk to me about Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, alternative therapies, and that. I, I don't really want to uh, deal um, uh, with, uh, w- w- with that tonight. All those that have emailed me in on those and want answers, Sunday evening, 10.30 to 12.30, I'll be there. You can come on and I'll happily answer all that range of questions. Um, uh, here's from Anne. It's that kind of hate talk that caused the Irish troubles. God is working in all churches. That's true, Anne. And, and I think we need to understand uh, that, uh, that love and that care. And uh, Tommy from Scotland, I guess this sums up. Hi, Doug. One of the best interviews I've ever watched on TD, TV. Well done for both of you. And I don't say that to blow my own trumpet. I tell you, I looked at that and Steve... Uh, one of my mates was sitting there watching me. He said, I, 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 "How do you feel about it? Yeah, have you, I, are you are you groaning at it?" And, I, and yes, I was because you look at yourself and you know you could do so all much better. But I tell you what, in that dressing room, the presence of God, we all came away blessed uh, at that time. And Dana, thank you so much for that. May each one of you know the blessing of God as we knew the blessing of God at that time. Walk with him. Let him work in your life. Look forward to seeing you again very soon. Glad you enjoyed, or most of you enjoyed it tonight. Bless you now. Bye. Bye.